There is another serious tragedy I have seen under the sun, and it weighs heavily on humanity. God gives some people great wealth and honor and everything they could ever want, but then he doesn't give them the chance to enjoy these things. They die, and someone else, even a stranger, ends up enjoying their wealth. This is meaningless, a sickening tragedy. A man might have a hundred children and live to be very old, but if he finds no satisfaction in life and doesn't even get a decent burial, it would have been better if he was born dead. His birth would have been meaningless and he would have ended in darkness. He wouldn't have even had a name and he wouldn't have seen the sun or even known its existence. Yet he would have had more peace than in growing up to be an unhappy man. He might live a thousand years twice over, but still not find contentment. And since he must die like everyone else, well, what's the use? All people spend their lives scratching for food, but they never seem to have enough. So are wise people really better off than fools? Do poor people gain anything by being wise and knowing how to act in front of others? Enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Just dreaming about nice things is meaningless. It's like chasing the wind. Everything has already been decided. It was known long ago what each person would be. So there's no use in arguing with God about your destiny. The more words you speak, the less they mean. So what good are they? In the few days of our meaningless lives, who knows how our days can best be spent? Our lives are like a shadow. Who can tell what will happen on this earth after we are gone? Hey, welcome to the fifth week of our verse by verse series of Ecclesiastes. So look, here, here we are, we're really, we're really at our halfway point through this journey. And here in chapter 5 and in chapter 6, Solomon now turns his attention to another very serious trap that he sees in the world. And it's called the greed trap. And when people fall into the greed trap, it's often very hard to climb out. Now, before we dive into the text today, I want to make a very quick disclaimer. Make sure you hear what I'm about to say. It's something I've actually said a few times during this series. As we read this part of Scripture today, we need to make sure we understand that there is nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong with working hard. In fact, uh, just a few weeks ago, Solomon reminded us that we are to work hard in life. Remember, you're not supposed to sit in your parents' basement and eat Doritos and watch ESPN. You remember that? We talked about that. You're supposed to work hard. There's nothing wrong with working hard. You're supposed to go out and, and work hard for the glory of God. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with earning a good salary. There's nothing wrong then with enjoying the things that you can buy with the money that you have. There's nothing wrong with having a nice house, a nice car. There's nothing wrong with going on great vacations. Look, if God has blessed you with these things, then you need to enjoy the things that God has given you to their fullest. There's nothing wrong with having these things in life. However, there is something absolutely wrong with putting all of your hope and trust in those things. There's something wrong when you put your identity into those things. There's something wrong when your very meaning and purpose for your life and the whole existence to your life is simply how much you can make, how much you can buy, or how much you can hoard. So there's nothing wrong with having money. Make sure you put today's uh, scripture in context. There's nothing wrong with having money, but there's absolutely something wrong with being greedy. You see, when your life goal is to simply have more and more and more, you're going to do anything and everything you can to get more and more and more. And what King Solomon is saying today is that when your heart is greedy, prepare to fall into the greed trap where you're actually going to be further away from heaven and closer to hell. Now look, let me explain something to you. 
This is exactly what happened to Satan. He was one of the most beautiful angels in heaven, if you know the story. One of the most beautiful angels in heaven. He was actually given one of the highest levels of leadership. But do you remember what happened to him? He became greedy. He wanted more. He wanted to actually become God. He wanted all the other angels to worship him. You see, Satan got greedy for power and prestige, and he wanted everything for himself. He wanted everything that God created. Now, if you remember, things didn't really turn out very well for Satan, and greed became the driving force of his life. So let me say this to you. When greed becomes the driving force of your life, things aren't going to turn out well for you either. And that's exactly what King Solomon says at the end of chapter 4, halfway through 5, and chapter 6. So let's get started. Let's look at what King Solomon has to say today. Uh, First, in chapter 4, for what's going to happen when you become greedy for power and prestige. Here's Ecclesiastes 4, 13 through 16. It is better to be a poor but wise youth than an old and foolish king who refuses all advice. Such a youth could rise from poverty and succeed. He might even become king, though he's been in prison. But then, everyone rushes to the side of yet another youth who replaces him. Endless crowds stand around him, but then another generation grows up and rejects him too. So it is all meaningless, like chasing the wind. Let's dive into this a little bit. Look, King Solomon is saying that you can spend your entire life, you can spend your entire life trying to gain power and prestige, but for some people, once you finally attain it, well, you might just get replaced with someone newer or younger or more popular. And Solomon is reminding us that everyone is replaceable. It's not something we like to hear, but we're all replaceable. Now look, regardless of how you perceive yourself, the world's going to continue on without you right? We're all replaceable. There's always someone waiting in the wing. There's always someone with just as much talent as you, just as much wisdom as you, just as much business savvy as you. And Solomon is saying, look, look, if your purpose or meaning in life is simply just to gain as much power and control as you can, then at some point, you're probably going to experience a pretty big letdown when that power and control and prestige is removed from your life. And look, he's, he's saying that your life is going to be meaningless and pointless if, if, if greed and power and prestige, if that sort of becomes your, your life's anthem song, if it sort of becomes the flag you wave in the wind, right? Or if it becomes the, the very fabric of your identity as a person. You see, being greedy for power and prestige, Solomon is saying is meaningless. It's like chasing the wind. Friends, if God has put you in a position of power or authority, then you need to hold that power in balance with your love and devotion to God. They need to be balanced. Never let the power and authority that you've been given define who you are. Because you see, God can give, but if you get too greedy, guess what? God can also take away. Now in chapter 5, Solomon continues to talk about the consequences of being greedy for power and prestige. In fact, he offers up kind of some, some nasty consequences to a person who says, yes, my life goal is only going to be, you know, however I can be as powerful as I can be. He's got some, some pretty devastating consequences. Let's look at this. Ecclesiastes 5, 8 through 9. Don't be surprised if you see a poor person being oppressed by the powerful and if justice is being miscarried throughout the land. For every official is under orders from higher up and matters of justice get lost in red tape and bureaucracy. Even the king milks the land for his own profit. So what does that mean? All right, so here's the reality. Here's what King Solomon is saying. When you fall deep into what we're calling sort of this greed trap, when you fall deep into the greed trap, you really can no longer see right from wrong because your only concern in life becomes how you, how you want to get more, right? How you want more authority, more power, more prestige, more control. 
And what is essentially can happen is you will walk over anyone you have to walk over. You will deceive anyone you have to deceive. You will backstab anyone you have to backstab. And you will sin in any way you have to sin so your greedy heart can get what it wants. Oh, and friends, Solomon is saying, look out, be careful, be very careful in your pursuit of power and prestige because there are some devastating effects for those with greedy hearts. As we continue our journey through chapter 5, Solomon suddenly then switches from, from power and prestige to money and wealth. And you see a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times these things go hand in hand. And Solomon has a lot to say about those that are greedy for more money or bigger homes or bigger toys, right? Ecclesiastes 5, 10 through 12. Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. The more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. So what good is wealth? Except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingertips. People who work hard sleep well whether they eat little or much. But the rich seldom get a good night's sleep. Interesting passage. Let's, let's dissect it. What's Solomon saying? Well, he's actually painting a portrait of the reality you will face if greed is at the center of your heart. When my life is filled with greed, I will, number one, never be satisfied. Friends, when your heart is filled with greed... You're essentially aligning yourself more with Satan and you're falling further away from God. Look, when, when you are constantly consumed with wanting more, 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 that's when you fall into that greed trap. Now look, our world inundates us with all these images of things we have to have. You know this well. You just see it in TV commercials, right? Buy this new car. You're going to be happier Get this big expensive boat. Life's going to be rewarding. Put $10,000 on a credit card for your vacation. You can slowly pay it off. You, you know, you only have one life to live, so, you know, spend as much as you can. Worry about the consequences later. One time, my wife and I, we actually got in the mail from a bank. It was called like a, what was it, a, a life loan or a life change loan. And we flipped it over and on the back it said, don't you want to be happier? Take out this loan so you can have more. I was like, what is happening? You see, this is how the devil slowly starts to change our mentality. And before we know it, greed is in our heart and we're never satisfied with what we have. We want more and more and more. And look, Solomon is saying, no, no, that type of thinking, that type of living, friends, trust me, this is Solomon, richest man to ever live on this planet. I was talking with a friend this morning doing some calculations. They think he was worth $2.2 trillion. Solomon, he's saying it's pointless. It's meaningless for greed to be at the center of your heart. That's like chasing the wind. That type of living does not honor the Lord. Look, when our life goal is all about getting more and more and more, we're gonna find that at the end of the day, we're not truly satisfied with what we do have. Moving on, Solomon actually gives us another warning to those that are all about greed. They want more. Here's Ecclesiastes 5, 13 through 14. There's another serious problem I've seen under the sun. Hoarding riches harms the saver. Money is, money is put into risky investments that turn sour and everything is lost. In the end, there is nothing left to pass on to one's children. Look, Solomon is saying that many times, many times, not always, but many times, people with, with, with greed-infested hearts, they'll make really poor decisions on how their money's going to be spent. And here, Solomon actually provides, it's interesting what he does, he provides two polar opposite examples, but they both arrive at the same result. You see what he's saying? He's saying, look, it's meaningless to have all this wealth and to be so scared that you're going to lose it you just set it over here and you hoard it and you never spend it on, on either yourself or others. He's saying that's meaningless. 
But then he also says it's, it's meaningless to take all the money that you have, only spend it on yourself, or to, to throw your money into, into investments that are risky and you end up losing all of your money. Solomon is saying that both of these extremes, it's not healthy and it doesn't make much sense. But why? Why is Solomon saying that this is pointless? Well, because either extreme has the same result that you're not able to bless others with some of the money that God has given you. When my life is filled with greed, I will, number two, I will never bless others. Here's some staggering statistics for you. In a recent article from Business Insider, author Emmy Martin wrote about the top 30 richest people on the planet. It's a fascinating article. Let me give you some of the stats. The 30th richest person on the planet, you ready for this, has a net worth of $22.5 billion. The 15th richest person on the planet has a net worth of $35.7 billion. The fifth richest person on the planet has a net worth of $58.5 billion. And you ready for this? The richest person on the planet, net worth, $85.2 $85.2 billion. If you add up all 30, this is in the article, if you add up uh, the total uh, net worth of the top 30 richest people in this world, you ready for this? 30 people, only 30 people. That's like just a few people in this section over here. All right, top 30 people in this world, net worth $1.23 trillion. 30 people. Now look, I'm not about to lecture or judge any of those people on how they spend their money. However, and this goes for all of us, there will absolutely come a day when we have to stand before our creator of this world and he's going to ask us, what did you do with what I gave you? And we're going to have to answer to that. Whether you make millions of dollars, whether you make $20,000 a year, God's going to ask you how you spent the money he blessed you with. And here's my guess. Some of us might have to look God and say to him, I hoarded my money. Or are you going to be able to say, no, no, I, some of that money, I, I helped. I, I, gave, I gave to others. Did, look, did you give some of it to God's church? Did you, did you give it so that people could learn more about Jesus? Did, did you use some of your money to help feed the homeless? Did you help a struggling widow? Did you help a mother trying to raise three kids on her own? How are you going to be able to answer that? Look, Solomon is saying that it is absolutely meaningless to just hoard your money and spend your money in reckless ways where you might end up losing all of your money. Instead, Solomon is saying that we should enjoy the paycheck. Absolutely, enjoy the money you have. Enjoy the home you have. Absolutely, enjoy it. Enjoy the car you drive. Enjoy those great vacations. God wants you to enjoy those things. But Solomon is saying don't spend everything on yourself. That's meaningless. That's greedy. That's like chasing the wind. But instead of spending everything you earn on yourself, Solomon says be wise. Be very wise with your money and bless others. Give some money to your children. Give some money to a friend. Give some money to someone who's hurting. Give some money to your church. Give give some money to a great organization that's making a difference in this country and around the world. But why? I mean, look, that's my money, right? I worked hard for that money. Why should I give anything to anybody? Solomon answers that in verses 15 through 17. We all come to the end of our lives as naked and empty-handed as on the day we were born. We can't take our riches with us. And this, too, is a very serious problem. People leave this world no better off than when they came. All their hard work is for nothing, like working for the wind. Throughout their lives, they live under a cloud, frustrated, discouraged, and angry. You see what Solomon is saying? He's saying that... Essentially what he's saying is that every time you see a cemetery, you should be reminded that everyone dies. 
He's saying that when you go to a funeral, you should be convinced that you can't take anything with you when you die. He's saying that you're never going to see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. He's saying that you really don't own anything. Look, friends, we, we came into this world possessionless, and we're also going to leave this world one day possessionless. And here's the point Solomon is trying to make. He's the wealthiest man to ever live on this planet. Here's the point he's trying to make. When my life is filled with greed, I will, number three, never be better off. Now look, this is, I think, hard sometimes for us to hear, especially as Americans. But there is a common lie that Satan tries to tell each of us. And for most Americans, this lie is always ringing in our ears, right? It's the lie that says, oh, if only I made more money, then I'd be better off. If only I had a bigger house, yeah, I'd be better off. If only I had that nicer car, I'd be better off. Now look, you don't have to agree with what I just said. It's okay if you don't. You can agree with me, you can disagree. But the reality is not going to change. That type of thinking is a lie from the enemy. It's plain and simple. You see, Satan has deceived us into thinking that once we get more money, once we get more stuff, then we're going to be better off and we're going to be so much happier. But then suddenly the, the sizzle fizzles. And before you know it, your happiness turns into envy and greed. And that's a very dangerous place to be when envy and greed fills your heart and you begin to want more and more and more and more. Friends, make sure you hear this. Maybe you haven't heard anything yet. Make sure you hear this. Contentment and material prosperity have nothing to do with one another. But our society tells us otherwise. You see, we fall into this greed trap that a better car, a bigger house, more toys, more stylish clothes. Yes, that's going to make me so much happier. But you see, that's all a part of the greed trap. The greed trap is intentionally deceptive so that once you fall in, it's really, really hard to get out. Now, friends, look, don't kid yourself. You're not going to be better off by being greedy and wanting more. The reality is that one day you're going to die and you can't take your money with you. Look, your net worth doesn't mean anything in heaven. Your portfolio doesn't mean anything in heaven. Your savings account doesn't mean anything in heaven. But what does matter in heaven is how you lived your life here on earth. Did you give your life to Jesus? Did you accept him as your Lord and Savior? Did you trust Jesus in all things? Did you trust him even when you were rich or even when you were poor? Or did you put your trust in your money or your house or your cabin or your IRA? Did you bless others with your time and talents and resources, or did you squander everything that God gave you on yourself? Look, friends, here's the reality. Heaven doesn't know you as the guy with the nice suit or the girl with the big house or the kid with the new bike. Heaven knows your heart. And Solomon is saying that living a greedy life, pointless, it's meaningless, it's like, chasing the wind. But then Solomon gives us the remedy. He gives us the remedy so that we won't fall into the greed trap. How can you avoid living a life chained down by your desires of wanting more? He tells us, you can avoid the greed trap when you enjoy what you've been given. Look, we're talking about contentment here. Enjoy what you've been given to its fullest. Be content with what you have. Be content with the job you have, the car you drive. Don't be greedy and want more than your neighbor or more than your friends. Enjoy what you've been given. And never let greed invade your heart. And again, it goes back to my disclaimer. This doesn't mean you don't work hard. Of course you work hard. This doesn't mean you don't accept that incredible job promotion. Of course you accept that if that's what God has for you. We're talking here, though, about being content with what God has given you. Ecclesiastes 5, 18 through 6, 2. Here's part of the remedy. Even so, I have noticed one thing, at least that is good. It is good for people to eat, drink, and enjoy their work under the sun during the short life God has given them and to accept their lot in life. And it is a good thing to receive wealth from God. It's a good thing. 
and the good health to enjoy it. To enjoy your work and accept your lot in life, this is indeed a gift from God. God keeps such people so busy enjoying life that they take no time to brood over the past. There's another serious tragedy I've seen under the sun, and it weighs heavenly, heavily on humanity. God gives some people great wealth and honor and everything they could ever want, but then he doesn't give them the chance to enjoy these things. They die, and someone else, even a stranger, ends up enjoying their wealth. This is meaningless and a sickening tragedy. Friends, this kind of goes back to, to last week's message. If you remember when we talked about that guy at the age of 41 who died, right? And he spent his whole life trying to earn more and more and more, and he completely left his family in the dust, and he ended up dying. This is kind of what this passage is saying. It's like, what was the point? What was the point? He worked so hard, he never enjoyed the money he made, he never enjoyed his family, and he ended up dying. Friends, you can avoid the greed trap when you live your life defined by who you are in Christ and not defined by how much you are worth or how much you have in the bank. Enjoy life. Stop being bitter that you don't have more. Don't be ungrateful for what you have. Thank God every day for what he has given you, what he has trusted you with, and enjoy your life to the fullest. Enjoy what you've been given and avoid falling into the greed trap of always wanting more and more and more. There's one more thing Solomon tells us in chapter six. How can I avoid the greed trap? He says, enjoy what you've been given. And number two, be fulfilled in what you have. Be fulfilled in what you have. Look, true happiness in your life. Look, if, well, here, here's the problem with the greed trap. If true happiness in your life if it comes from something you deposit, something you drive, something you drink, or something you adorn yourself with, then you're never going to be happy or fulfilled with what you have. But when you put your meaning and purpose and fulfillment in life into Jesus Christ, that's different. That's different. Then you will be truly satisfied and fulfilled, no matter how much money you have or how little money you have. Look, instead of, instead of finding your fulfillment in all of these material possessions, put your fulfillment in the things that will last forever. Look, your money's not gonna last forever. Your home's not gonna last forever. Your car, your cabin, your investments, those things aren't going to last forever. So don't put all of your joy and fulfillment in those things. But put your joy and fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Look, your relationship with your children and your friends and your parents and your neighbors, those are things that can potentially last forever into eternity. Put your joy and satisfaction in those things. Stop being greedy for power and wealth and start investing into the things that actually bring about everlasting fulfillment in this life and the life to come. Ecclesiastes 6, 7 through 9. All people spend their life scratching for food, but they never seem to have enough. So are wise people really better off than fools? Do poor people gain anything by being wise and knowing how to act in front of others? Enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Just dreaming about nice things is meaningless. It's like chasing the wind. Friends, here's the bottom line from chapter 5 and 6. The only thing that will truly satisfy you in this world is a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the only thing. Look, you've, you've had a bad week at work and you need something that's gonna make you happy. Don't go buy that expensive pair of shoes and you're gonna have to start making monthly payments for the next six months on them. Instead of new shoes, try Jesus. Look, after having a challenging phone call with your ex, don't binge on nachos and Netflix. Try Jesus. When waves of storms and trials come crashing into your life, don't fall for the lie that more money, more property, more vacations will turn your sadness into celebration. You see, the only thing, no matter what situation you face, the only thing that will bring satisfaction and fulfillment in every season and cycle of life is Jesus. And that's what King Solomon is saying. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word here today. Father, we thank you for the ways that you have blessed us. Father, we know that there's, there's a lot of people here today. 
And there's, there's people here who by, the, by worldly standards, we have lots and lots of money. There's people here who hardly have anything to their name and they're, they're, they're barely getting by. But God, your word encourages us to enjoy what we do have. Don't become bitter. Don't become angry at the things that we want or the things we don't have. Allow us to enjoy what you have given us. But furthermore, allow us to experience true happiness and satisfaction in you, in you. Father, I want to pray now for those here today. Maybe they've spent a lifetime trying to find happiness. Maybe, maybe they've tried finding happiness in more money, in more homes or more cars or, or wealth or more power more prestige. And maybe there's some people here today who are exhausted because they realize that those things won't bring true happiness and fulfillment. And so God, I pray right now for those who are here and they know, yes, it's time for Jesus. It's time for me to be truly satisfied and fulfilled through Jesus. For those here, I wanna encourage you, just pray this prayer along with me. Just simply say, Heavenly Father, I need you. I'm tired of trying to find meaning and purpose in worldly pleasures. And so today, Jesus, I put my anchor and hope in you. I want to live for you. I want to die for you. I want to be forever yours. And so Jesus, I accept you. I ask you to come into my heart and into my life. And I pray, Lord, that this day would be a turning point for my faith. Hey, if you just prayed that with heads still bowed, eyes closed, would you just raise your hand? Let us know that you prayed that. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Amen. Jesus, thank you. And now, Jesus, we welcome these new believers home. We welcome them into your eternal home where they will forever experience true fulfillment and true happiness and joy. We pray this in the power of Jesus' name. Amen.